Just imagine Jesus trying with all of his might to do something and failing miserably. That's exactly the tiny loser Jesus that Christianity portrays to the world, while simultaneously proclaiming a false Satan, who is actually quite successful. Here is the true Jesus, the biggest Jesus, your Savior. Christ died for your sins. He was entombed. He was roused the third day. God is at peace with you. Be at peace with God. In part one of this series, I showed how Christianity promotes another Satan who is very different from the Satan of Scripture. This Satan, many will say, is the creator of evil, in essence making him co-creator with God. This elevates Satan and diminishes God. In this episode of The Biggest Jesus, I will show you how Christianity says that sin and death, which were brought about by the acts of Satan, will remain components in God's creation forever and ever. Christianity may well admit that God and Jesus eventually gain control over Satan, but they somehow are unable to undo the acts of the adversary that brought about sin and death in God's creation. The annihilationists within Christianity try to teach us that death will remain forever and ever. Those within Christianity that teach eternal conscious torment, like John MacArthur, the creator of the attacking bear preaching technique, try to convince us that sin will remain in God's creation forever and ever. Those that teach eternal conscious torment say that those who are tormented forever and ever will continue to hate God forever and ever. Thus, they will be sinning forever and ever. So, God must continue to punish them forever and ever. Do you think they've even read the scriptures? What do you think? The Apostle John wrote something pretty cool regarding the acts of the adversary and the work of Christ our Savior. 1 John 3, 8 from the Concordant Literal New Testament. Yet he who is doing sin is of the adversary, for from the beginning is the adversary sinning. For this was the Son of God manifest, that he should be annulling the acts of the adversary. Christ, the Son of God, was manifested to annul the acts of the adversary. That word annulling is from the Greek luo. It means to loose. It's used in a broad sense of any type of disintegration. So whatever acts the adversary has committed, they will be loosed. They will be disintegrated by Christ, the Son of God. Now, does it say here that he will loose or undo or annul all of the adversary's acts? It doesn't have to, because we see quite clearly that John says the adversary has been sinning from the beginning. This is a great indicator to us that Christ will annul the acts of the adversary from the beginning. So starting with his very first sinful act on through to every remaining act, those are the acts that will be annulled by Christ, the Son of God, successfully. My God, do you think anybody in Christianity believes this scripture? Now, if anyone watching this video believes that Jesus will not annul all of the acts of the adversary, please comment below and please provide your scriptural support for your belief that Jesus will not annul all of the adversary's acts. Thank you. So we see that the adversary has been sinning from the beginning, and Jesus is going to take care of all of that. Here's another powerful passage that describes for us the nefarious acts of the adversary that he's been doing his whole career. His entire criminal career can be summed up with just a few words. Sin, death, and deception. Here in John 8, 44, Jesus is speaking to some Jews that wanted to kill him. You are of your father, the adversary, and the desires of your father you are wanting to do. He was a man killer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, for truth is not in him. Whenever he may be speaking a lie, he is speaking of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. We see here that Satan has been a man killer from the beginning, and he doesn't stand in the truth. He is the father of lies. Satan deals in death and deception and sin. Sin is the missing of the mark. Satan has been dealing out death and deception to humanity ever since his encounter with Adam and Eve in the garden. The adversary is damn good at what he does and he is very efficient. His one deception in the garden affected all of humanity 
And in reality, it affected all of God's creation. The one lie he told to Eve caused her to eat, and she gave to Adam, and he ate. And that one sin caused death to pass through all mankind. Adam was the first domino to fall, and human dominoes by the tens of thousands fall around us each and every day. We read in Romans 5.12 the devastating effect on humanity from the adversary's sin. Therefore, even as through one man sin entered into the world, and through sin death, thus death passed through into all mankind, on which all sinned. We all inherit death from Adam. We were included in Adam. The adversary's act that led to Adam's sin has affected each and every one of us as the disease of death passed through into all mankind. We know this is a fact. We cannot deny this fact. We see the evidence around us each and every day. And because we are mortal, because death has passed through us all, we have all sinned and fallen short of God's ideal. We have fallen short of God's glory. Did I mention that Satan was damn good at what he did and very efficient? Is mainstream Christianity right? Is this satanic shit show going to continue forever with sin and death being a part of God's creation? Is God going to snatch a few people out of this current situation and go off and have a little paradise somewhere while sin and death rage on in his creation forever and ever? Now, enter the Son of God. Let's see if Jesus was successful at doing anything about the adversary's act and the resulting sin and death that came from that through Adam. Romans 5, 18 through 19. Consequently then, as it was through one offense for all mankind for condemnation, thus also it is through one just award for all mankind for life's justifying. For even as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were constituted sinners, thus also through the obedience of the one, the many shall be constituted just. We were all placed onto team Adam without our permission. Adam stepped up to the plate and struck out, and all of humanity lost because he struck out. No trophy, no gold stars, no gold medals. We all lose because of that one sin. And that's just not fair. But I really do like big butts. The second half of verse 18. Thus also it is through one just award for all mankind for life's justifying. Just as God placed us on Adam's team without our permission, he put us on Jesus' team. And we're just bench warmers. We don't do anything. Jesus went up there, nailed the solo home run, and we all get the championship ring. We all get a championship ring with our name on it. We are part of the team. God didn't ask us to be a part of Adam's team. He didn't ask us to be a part of Jesus' team. Neither scenario is really fair. On the negative side with Adam and on the positive side with Christ. Are you going to argue with God now? Now that you know that you are on the winning team? Condemnation came to all mankind through Adam. Life's justifying came through Christ. No matter how much sin and death rages and reigns around us, the justification for our lives, our immortal lives in the future, will be based on the one act of Christ. Verse 19, For even as through the disobedience of the one man, the many, meaning all, were constituted sinners, thus also through the obedience of the one, the many shall be constituted just. You are right in God's eyes because of the work of Christ and because of the fact that you are on Team Jesus. I've actually heard big-time leaders in mainstream Christianity say that those that proclaim the salvation of all through Christ have one verse or one passage that they can point to that proves the salvation of all. The passage we just looked at is very strong. If you don't believe what the scriptures teach, that's between you and God. But there are several other proofs that show us that Jesus is successful in overcoming death not only for himself and some of humanity, but for all of humanity. Check this out. One of the greatest passages proving the successful work of the Savior of the world, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 26. For since in fact through a man came death, through a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Yet each in his own class, 
the first fruit Christ, thereupon those who are Christ's in his presence, thereafter the consummation, whenever he may be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father, whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power, for he must be reigning until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy is being abolished, death. So we see again that death came through Adam, but the resurrection of the dead comes through Christ. Verse 22 is key. For even as in Adam, all are dying. All that were on team Adam, that's every single human being, are dying. Thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. All who are on team Jesus, that's all humanity, will be vivified because of Christ's work. What does that word vivified mean? The word vivified means to be made immortal. Verse 23, yet each in his own class, the first fruit, Christ. Christ was the first to be vivified. He is the only human currently with immortality. Therefore, what happened to him is the living definition of being vivified. He was raised to immortality. But we read on in verse 23, thereupon those who are Christ in his presence. This is the second class of people who will be vivified, made immortal when Christ comes for them. And finally, verse 24, thereafter the consummation. This is the third and final class to be vivified. Thus we have all who will be vivified, Christ, those who are Christ in his presence, thereafter the consummation. And then we see some of the things that happen at the consummation. He may be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father, whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and all power. For he must be reigning until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. The reign of Christ has an expiration date. Not in a negative way, it has an expiration date because his reign is completely and utterly successful. There is nothing left to reign over. Verse 26, the last enemy is being abolished death. The adversary deals in death. Christ abolishes death. This is speaking of the second death. Death in every shape and form in all of God's creation will be abolished by Christ. Do you realize what you've just witnessed? The end of death. I'm about to go Pentecostal on y'all brothers and sisters. But I will spare you because I'm not good at doing the Pentecostal thing. Eh, eh, mm. Death is down. Sin and deception remain. Will the Savior of the world, will the Son of God undo those also? John 1, 29. On the morrow, John the Baptist is observing Jesus coming toward him and is saying, Lo, the Lamb of God, which is taking away the sin of the world. Did Jesus successfully take away the sin? Did he remove sin as a barrier between man and God, between the creation and God? Yes. The biggest Jesus, the true Jesus, is successful in all that he does. And we read in Hebrews 9, 26, Yet now once, at the conclusion of the eons, for the repudiation of sin through his sacrifice, is he manifest. Christ came for the repudiation of sin through his sacrifice. His sacrifice is what took down sin. The full repudiation where sin will have no more place in the universe will be realized at the consummation of the eons. Death and sin are done by the work of Christ. Completely done. Now what will happen to all the deception that has happened from the father of lies, the adversary, Satan. We see from 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, how the adversary uses deception to cause perishing in the unbeliever. Now, if our evangel, otherwise known as the good news or the well message, is covered, also it is covered in those who are perishing, in whom the God of this eon blinds the apprehensions of the unbelieving, so that the illumination of the evangel of the glory of Christ who is the image of the invisible God, does not irradiate them. Satan is currently deceiving unbelievers. He is blinding them so that they do not understand the truth of Christ. Because of the barrier of deception, what is God's will concerning this deception, this great act of the adversary against the unbelieving? God has made his will very clear on this matter of deception. 1 Timothy 2.4 our Savior God wills that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth. 
This is not just a realizing of the truth and then being cast into hell forever and ever. This is God willing that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth. Both prongs of his will in this verse must be understood to work together. The salvation and the realization of the truth go hand in hand and work together to complete God's will for all mankind. When all come to realize the truth, deception is done. The successful Savior will completely remove sin, death, and deception from God's entire creation. And there will no longer be any barriers between God and man, between God's creation and God. We currently have Christ Jesus as the mediator between God and man. And eventually, he will not even need to be a mediator when God is all in all. Even Preston Sprinkle and Francis Chan will come to realize the truth of the salvation of all through the successful work of Christ Jesus, the Savior of the world. If this video has helped you, please hit the like and subscribe button down below to get this message out to a wider audience. This is the truth that sets free, that Christ is successful. I invite you to watch this video next. <laughs>